Even if you're just a casual fan of dinosaurs and other prehistoric animals, I can almost guarantee you that you've heard of ichthyosaurs. And despite not being the most popular, and likely even the most underrated group of Mesozoic marine reptiles, with their large eyes and sometimes massive, half-porpoise, half-fish bodies, they remain one of the most iconic and distinct groups in all of paleontology. To any fan of the study of ancient life, odds are that you're at least familiar with the idea that some of these amazing creatures were possibly deep-sea hunters, but it's less likely that you know the story behind this idea, or even how these ichthyosaurs might have gotten a literal sickness from this very lifestyle, and what surprising reality it might infer. Like all other prehistoric Mesozoic marine reptiles, ichthyosaurs were not dinosaurs or even closely related to them. But they did live during the same time. The earliest beginnings of ichthyosaurs likely sprouted just before the end of the Permian, but it's after the infamous Great Dying in the early Triassic, about 250 million years ago, that our earliest evidence of ichthyosaurs has been discovered, in the form of small animals like the basal ichthyosauriform Cartororhynchus, who, like all other currently known ichthyosaurian ancestors, was already a strong swimmer, even though it could most likely haul itself onto land similar to today's seals and sea lions. Ichthyosaurs quickly diverged into, and kinda even invented, or at the very least perfected, most oceanic predatory niches known today. Ichthyosaurs were definitely in their heyday during the Triassic in terms of sheer diversity and marine dominance, but it was later in the Jurassic where the ichthyosaurs arguably reached their peak, with some of their most specialized forms remaining among the most common marine predators by the late Jurassic, even among the competition from typically far larger reptilian predators like plesiosaurs and pliosaurs. By the Middle Cretaceous period, ichthyosaurs had dwindled in numbers, and completely disappeared from the fossil record about 90 million years ago in the late Cretaceous. But despite not being able to see the Mesozoic through to the end, ichthyosaurs were certainly the longest-lasting lineage of Mesozoic marine reptiles, and even debatably the most successful. It's about smack dab in the middle of their reign over the Mesozoic seas, during the middle to late Jurassic, where these super specialized bodied ichthyosaurs really start stirring up some deep sea sediment. Some ichthyosaurs, like the late Jurassic Ophthalmosaurus, have been discovered with evidence of osteonecrosis, a disease caused by reduced blood flow to bone tissue, resulting in a condition called avascular necrosis, which is essentially a fancy word to describe the death of bone tissue due to a lack of or a disturbance in blood supply. Osteonecrosis is a condition you can find today in modern humans, and is usually associated with drinking too much alcohol and prolonged steroid usage. Which doesn't really have anything to do with the topic of this video, but it might scare a few of you. More significantly to the topic of discussion, osteonecrosis is something that can be found in scuba divers, and in this case it's almost always associated with decompression sickness, or more commonly known as the bends. Divers usually experience the bends after ascending from a considerable depth without proper pressure adjustment staging procedures. So what actually happens when a diver gets the bends? Well, to start with, we need to understand the precedent for aquatic pressure. Due to the loosely packed nature of liquid molecules, the deeper you go, the more densely packed the molecules become, and thanks to good old-fashioned gravity, this can become very powerful very fast. About every 10 meters of depth, the pressure increases by one atmosphere, which is a fancy unit of measurement for underwater pressure. All that you need to know is that one atmosphere is equivalent to about 14.6 pounds per square inch of pressure. You can even feel this rapid change in pressure at your local swimming pool, and if you have ever sunk to the bottom of the deep end, you know just how obvious the pressure difference can be. So when a scuba diver rapidly ascends without taking time to acclimate to changing pressure, gases within the bloodstream which were just under immense pressure are now being quickly exposed to lower pressures, causing them to expand and form gas bubbles, which begin blocking up circulation throughout the body. And it's during this state of lower blood flow that this osteonecrosis condition occurs. But humans are not the only animals of present day that are known to be affected by decompression syndrome. In fact, there's an entire family. Yep, you guessed it, cetaceans. Many whales have been known to get the bends, and evidence of osteonecrosis has been found in the bones of multiple species, including the massive sperm whales, and it's these deep sea diving whales that give us our best modern look at why Ophthalmosaurus and its late Jurassic relatives have also been found to be affected by avascular necrosis. But we'll be coming back to this, so keep these whales in mind. First, we need to understand why we even think these specialized ichthyosaur predators were traveling into the depths to begin with. Ichthyosaurs actually have a ridiculously good preservation history, and this excellent collection of fossil specimens has allowed us to understand things like their eye structure, diet, birthing methods. Yes, we know that ichthyosaurs gave birth to live young and that these babies came out tail first as to prevent the babies from drowning during birth, I know it's crazy, and even possibly the color of their skin. 
We know thanks to preserved stomach contents that ichthyosaurs had a very wide diet, even sometimes including clams and turtles. But the late Jurassic ichthyosaurs like Ophthalmosaurus primarily focused on fish and cephalopods, many of which have been considered to possibly live deeper in the sea. Well, while it's a good start, just because some of the food that they ate might have lived deeper in the sea isn't enough of a reason to assume that ichthyosaurs did too. However, one of their most characteristic features just may give us a better idea. Ichthyosaur eyes have been the subject of long-term debates, but one thing is for sure, many of these marine reptiles had massive eyes, like the early Jurassic Temnodontosaurus platyodon, which had the largest eyes of any known animal. They could get bigger than a soccer ball. Even our very own buddy Ophthalmosaurus, who was less than half the size of Temnodontosaurus, had similarly sized eyes, making it possess some of the largest eyes relative to body size of any animal, and possibly the largest of all vertebrates. These massive eyes were also reinforced with sturdy sclerotic rings to protect their eyes from the shifting positive to negative pressures as they swam. So why would these ichthyosaurs need such large eyes? It has been suggested that the adaptation of these large eyes would help ichthyosaurs, like Ophthalmosaurus, to see their prey at even greater depths. But in 2002, Stuart Humphreys and Graeme D. Ruxton disproved this theory. Humphreys and Ruxton compared the F number, or ratio of the focal length, of Ophthalmosaurus to that of modern-day elephant seals, who are known to forage at depths in excess of 1,000 meters. What they found is that Ophthalmosaurus had an eye sensitivity about 2.5 to 4 times greater than that of elephant seals, which sounds like a lot, but surprisingly, this is actually where we run into the hiccup. You see, light intensity in the ocean decreases by approximately 90% every 70 meters you drop, so this extra eye sensitivity that Ophthalmosaurus possessed really really only buys at about 42 meters of extra visual depth. One thing that these eyes would do for Ophthalmosaurus is actually make its image clearer. So at a depth where we humans or even elephant seals may be able to see a vague outline of an animal, Ophthalmosaurus may have been able to see a more proper image of what it's looking at. So in reality, the increased eye size would pose an advantage for a deep sea predator, but more in the direction of greater acuity instead of sensitivity. More evidence appeared in 2014 when... Um, a lot of people from the Department of Geology at Lund University in Sweden released a paper on skin pigmentation of extinct reptiles. You may have heard of this one, as it was a very big deal at the time. In the paper, it was found that an as-of-yet unnamed ichthyosaur specimen was uncovered with proper skin impressions. Upon examining the fossilized melanosome-like microbodies, we finally got an idea of what some of these porpoise fish-bodied ichthyosaurs may have looked like. It suggested that this ichthyosaur was entirely black, which would perfectly line up with the lifestyle spending a lot of time in the deep ocean, as the darker you are, the less likely you'll be visible in low lighting conditions. However, a paper by Jakob Vinther in 2015 questions the validity of this preserved pigmentation, by making the very valid argument that the supposedly preserved melanosomes are just one layer to a system which determines integument coloration in life, so in reality, we don't know what the color of the individual was for sure. Finally, this brings us back to the preserved osteonecrosis in the fossilized bones of Ophthalmosaurus. With our current knowledge of what causes decompression sickness in modern animals, why would Ophthalmosaurus and related genera get it in the first place? As in all cases of decompression sickness, it is suggested that there had to be a relatively rapid ascent, not allowing for the body to safely decompress. In modern cetaceans, it has been suggested that this phenomena could be caused by attempted predator evasion, like perhaps a dolphin or humpback calf fleeing an orca. But large sperm whales are also known to get the bends, and it's hard to imagine them fleeing a predator. While it is possible that these animals could be fleeing another individual of their species, it is more likely that these discrepancies are caused by the noxious noises of seismic air guns used in oil expansion and or sonar, like in the case in 2002 where 14 beached whales were discovered to have evidence of avascular necrosis that was linked to naval sonar exercises in the area. Based off of this modern precedent, and the evidence presented in B.M. Rothschild's 2012 paper on the subject, he has suggested that these cases of osteonecrosis and ichthyosaurs may be the result of such predator evasion tactics. Rothschild suggests that that a complete lack of osteonecrosis in Triassic ichthyosaurs may be a direct reflection of the fact that these ichthyosaurs, usually being apex predators themselves, had less threats from other predators, had less nimble prey, and or simply didn't lead the same lifestyle as early to late Jurassic genera. Rothschild further suggests that these early to late Jurassic ichthyosaurs, like Ophthalmosaurus, may have been getting decompression sickness due to evasion of the now present larger Jurassic predators, or due to the pursuit of increasingly agile prey, and also that the resulting effects of the bends on these animals may have contributed to their untimely demise. A 2017 study by Agnita Weinreich Carlson backs up and affirms this trend with Triassic to Jurassic ichthyosaurs. It was confirmed with this study that none of the studied Triassic genera had evidence of decompression sickness, while the highest frequency 
frequency of osteonecrosis was found in Jurassic genera like Temnodontosaurus, Ichthyosaurus, and Ophthalmosaurus, with the latter two having both the highest frequency and the most elements containing evidence of avascular necrosis respectively. So... Were there possibly some other deep sea predators, even bigger than these Jurassic ichthyosaurs, that were spooking them and effectively forcing them to get themselves the bends? It's certainly possible. However, later in 2012, John Heyman would release his paper titled Deep Diving Dinosaurs. Okay, questionably incorrect identification of dinosaurs aside, this paper respectfully served to question some of the causes for osteonecrosis in ichthyosaurs, as suggested by Rothschild in his paper from earlier that year, and also suggested a new possible cause for the disease. Heyman instead suggests that these deformities in the bones may just be a result of their prolonged excursions to deeper regions of the water column. He also emphasizes that the evidence seen in these ichthyosaurs doesn't suggest more developed changes related to decompression sickness, and that they may have occurred completely unassociated with any any muscle or joint pain, elaborating that these animals' hunting ability and reproductive success would have been unaffected due to no likely changes to the reptile's mobility, nor would it have caused any substantial threat to its life. We know that these ichthyosaurs would have been capable of reaching such extreme depths, as stated in Ryosuke Motani's paper from 2005, with the very conservative estimate of being able to hold its breath for a 20-minute dive, and a more reasonably estimated cruising speed of 2 meters per second, Ophthalmosaurus could have easily reached depths of 600 meters and resurfaced, concluding that ichthyosaurs similar to Ophthalmosaurus were more than capable of excursions to the deep sea, but whether it was predator evasion, pursuit of agile prey, and or prolonged ventures into the deep, the exact cause of osteonecrosis in their bones is still up in the air. Now this is not based off of any papers, but I'd personally like to suggest a fourth option. These animals are marine reptiles, so that dependency to resurface periodically to breathe makes me think that occasionally these ichthyosaurs could have easily gotten distracted by a predator or prey and simply mistakenly took too long to return to the surface, resulting in an emergency rapid ascent, which may be a cause for the discovered osteonecrosis. All four options are completely plausible, and it very well may be that these deformities in the bones of ichthyosaurs may have resulted from a mix of multiple or all of these possibilities. Whatever the cause is, these amazing animals remain infinitely fascinating. <clears throat> oh, uh, so what do you think was the cause for avascular necrosis in ichthyosaurs? And in the deep sea, were they the hunters or the hunted? Let me know in the comments below. Also be sure to let me know if you like this video and you'd like to see more, and maybe suggest a topic for me to explore in the series. But before I go, I wanted to give a massive shout out to Destin Bogart from Edge for all of his behind the scenes help and contributions to finding the information needed for this video. Go check out his channel if you want to learn more about awesome topics like this one. I'd also like to thank my friends David Brigette and Gibson Kite for their amazing artistic contributions to this video. Their Instagrams, as well as all the scientific resources used for this video will be linked in the description below. I've been completely obsessed with these penguin porpoise dudes for the last week or so, and I had a total blast diving into all the research that went into this video. So I hope you guys enjoyed, stay safe, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.